Uh, there most certainly are. I think one of the uh, misleading conceptions about the internet is the type of language that we use. For example, we're constantly talking about Wi-Fi, uh, data, uh, streaming, but we don't really uh, care to know or we don't really think often about how those uh, actions are linked to CO2 and carbon emission. I think what we oftentimes uh, don't understand is that uh, Google as a company, for example, can be a carbon neutral company. Um, but the actual use of the internet uh, in any capacity is always going to require electricity. Um, subsequently as well with Google, there are often and large social media uh, companies uh, such as uh, Instagram or Facebook, they rely on third party data centers to store their information. And so while Facebook, for example, can claim to be carbon neutral, um, we're not always exactly sure of how carbon neutral the third party companies that are storing this data are. Um, and I think when uh, ultimately this causes a huge issue when you consider um, platforms like Google, wherein you might be able to Google um, using very little carbon. For example, uh, you know, a Google search is 0.2 grams of CO2, uh, but they're directing you to sites that otherwise could utilize far more um, CO2 carbon emissions per page or per like or per you know visit um, that Google is completely not a part of. Um, and I think too, going back to the maths with regards to the 0.2 grams of CO2, um, there are roughly 8.5 billion Google searches per day. And so this kind of adds up uh, very quickly. Right, so one of the things that we noticed was that we had commercial airlines, for example, they produce roughly 900 million metric tons per year. Uh, that they were reduced was noticeable. Um, but problematic uh, enough, we saw an uptick, a large extreme uptick in the use of and the reliance on the internet. Um, people were streaming more, they were emailing more because they were working from home. So uh, those interactions that you have in the office now become email transactions. Um, and to put things into perspective uh, with regards to email, um, since 2019, there's roughly been 300 billion emails sent uh, per, per year. Uh, this number is obviously increasing as a result of COVID. And what that amounts to when you just consider in-text emails, so text emails, not image or documents, um, that's estimated at around four grams per email. So that thank you email that you'd send to your colleague, that's about four grams of CO2 released. And the bigger problem is when you start to scale, mathematically scale this problem up, uh, especially during the global pandemic when everybody was working from home, uh, we're roughly seeing about 429 million uh, metric, ton uh, <laughs> metric tons of, of CO2 produced per day. Um, which carries about half the bulk load of the entirety of the internet's uh, CO2 consumption. Yes, uh, sending multiple emails a day definitely contributes to your own personal carbon footprint. Um, this isn't to guilt you, this isn't to, to make people think that um, you know, you, you shouldn't send emails or that you shouldn't uh, send vital information for work, um, but there's some things that can be done. Uh, for example, you know, if every adult uh, in, in, in the United Kingdom, for example, uh, sent one less or sent, uh, did not send a, a thank you email, it could save uh, roughly 16,000 metric tons of CO2 a year. Um, now that's really not a lot uh, uh, compared to the four, 500 thousand or 500 million uh, metric tons being produced just from the email alone, but that's also just one country. That's just the UK. If you start scaling that up and considering the United States, Canada, um, all of Europe, uh, China, for example, um, that number could significantly uh, shift. And of course, you know, this would also shift our, uh, our understanding of social uh, uh, relations as maybe you send your boss an email and they don't reply. Um, 
that's something we might have to forego or develop another method by which we communicate that an email has been received. Yeah, they are incredibly substantial. And, and what I'm finding is the more you do the research and the more you start to really look into um, how um, platforms like Netflix, for example, are quantifying their uh, carbon um, emissions, uh, you start to get really uh, either scared or um, the numbers start to become so massive that it doesn't make sense. Um, for example, uh, taking TikTok, which is roughly five grams of CO2 per minute of scrolling. Um, and when you kind of think about that in terms of uh, the one billion users who spend roughly uh, 52 minutes per day, um, that equates to about 84 million metric tons of CO2 produced per year just from TikTok. So to tie this into the, the global perspective, uh, uh, take a 10-year-old uh, mature tree. Uh, that absorbs roughly 22 kilograms of CO2 um, uh, per, per, per year. Um, so, so sadly, uh, it would take roughly 204 million trees to absorb just one year's worth of TikTok. Um, now we have this, uh, we have billions and billions and billions of trees on this planet, um, uh, but what we need to start thinking about globally is minimizing or at least producing practical methods by which we mitigate these uh, numbers. Um, and of course I think this doesn't just fall on us, I think it falls on the companies, specifically the social, social media, streaming um, platforms to actually pledge to become carbon neutral, um, both for third party being careful uh, about what uh, data center or the types of data centers uh, Google chooses to deal business with and also subsequently um, uh, focus on ways to, to produce um, the same access to the material but yet it requires less carbon.